Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to start off by uh, thanking uh, Weirdale Lithium for organising this meeting, especially Stuart, who twisted my arm up my back, as he no doubt did for all the other speakers. Um, to really be part of this meeting has um, it's been an education, and of course that's the reason why I work in a university, it's to learn. Uh, there's a lot that I've learned today that I should take away. This also has been a meeting where I've gone down memory lane. In the mid-1970s, believe it or not, I was mapping the lithium granites in Cornwall, which is uh, the site of the uh, production now uh, of hard rock lithium in southwest England. Uh, so it's kind of nice to see things that have gone around full circle coming back. And um, I recall visiting the Tanko Pegmatite and looking at spodumene underground. And you know, it was really quite remarkable to go around the, a mine that takes spodumene out from crystals that are as big as the room we had our lunch in. So a lot of memory lane there. What I'd particularly like to do, though, before starting here is to um, remember Paul Younger as well. And uh, Paul Younger is a past president of this place. I think he probably haunts it. I don't know whether that is true, but no doubt there are footsteps at night which will be Paul's, and no doubt he's listening to the recording of this somewhere else. But um, Paul was someone who I taught when I started as a lecturer in Newcastle in the 1980s. And then coming back here from Manchester in 2000, uh, Paul was the first person to welcome me back. And um, it wasn't long before we started looking at the geothermal prospects, even though I was doing a completely different job. He said, forget all that. This is what matters. And that's how the story of the Eastgate borehole began. And what I want to do in the time I've got with you now is to explain the background to this, uh, to tell the story of where we came from, if you like, to get to this point um, with the activity that there is in uh, Weirdale. So Paul is definitely a partner in crime to this. And uh, I think he would be more delighted than anyone to see the audience in the room and to be able to uh, know that this type of, this meeting has taken place in this region, a region of which he was so proud. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about the geological background uh, to the site. We've had some of this before, but maybe as a slightly different take. I'll talk about the borehole itself and the history of how the borehole was put down, and then a little bit about the water chemistry, which is what uh, takes us into the lithium story. Now, we've already heard a little bit about this, about the way in which we have the special geology of northeast England. It's a region which has been mined extensively. The grey on this map with Newcastle on Tyne and Durham on as bullet points there is the coal bearing sequence. And of course, that goes under the surface of the sea as you head towards the east. Um, the other point there is at Eastgate, which is in the pale blue colour, which is where we're looking at the metal mining region, uh, a region which was mined by the London Lead Company for 200 years. Can you imagine that? A company lasting 200 years mining in this area. And all the social good that that, that London Lead uh, Company did for the region is, is, is there for all to see in the hills in the North Pennines Geopark at the present day. What this means is that we know a huge amount about the subsurface. That is one of the remarkable things about this region, that there's a huge amount of knowledge. Some of that knowledge is anecdotal, uh, but the vast quantity of it is lodged in this building, in the British Geological Survey, in written record, and now increasingly online. What makes it so special, though, is the geology where we've seen the maps that we saw earlier with the fault systems, and in particular, in the region of Newcastle, we've got this fault, which we call the Stublick 90 Fathom Fault System, which is a major fault. It comes out on the coast, for those of you who know the region, at colour coats. And so you can see the fault there, and the way it puts one lot of rocks against another. North of the fault, there's a deep sedimentary basin full of sediments. And south of it, that sequence is much thinner because it is buoyed up by the Weirdale granite, which we've heard about before. The granite is a buoyant rock, and it sort of acts like a bit of a cork. The carboniferous sediments which formed on top of it were much thinner than they were further north. That is critical. That granite is critical because it is the focal point for the mineral deposits of the north of England that were mined by the London Lead Company and others, in fact, supposedly going back to uh, Roman times. But the curious thing about it is that 
there's a zoning of the mineral deposits. So you find that uh, there's a, a hard core, if you like, of fluorite deposits in the middle of Weardale, and then as you go out, you get a sequence of other minerals that are formed at lower temperatures. So that previously was a mystery until in the mid-1960s, uh, Sir Kingsley Dunham at Durham University drilled the first borehole in the area into Rookup, uh, Rookup into the Weardale granite and proved the existence of a granite. All the theories went out of the window because the granite was older than the rocks that contained the mineralization. And that's not how it's meant to happen when you look at the way mineralization is associated with granite in Cornwall. It's different. And that upset an apple cart, but it didn't change the fact that those mineral deposits were there. Uh, it's changed our understanding of why they are there. So we've learned a huge lot about mineral deposits, water circulation, granites, the interaction of all those things in this region. Now, as a spotty youth of a lecturer, I was um, able to visit Camber Keel's mine, which some of you will know. Uh, this is the mine entry uh, that I uh, uh, photographed a few years ago now. And I visited it in 1988 and 1989 with Dave Strutt, the mine geologist, and we were able to go underground. And what was fascinating about that was the uh, encounter with warm water. So you're going in a, in a mine along a drive underground, and there's warm water raining down from the roof above you onto you, warm enough to take a shower. Now, that was pretty convincing evidence that there was a warm water resource there. So we, we looked at that, and um, we can see on this image, there's an arrow in the bottom right there where we sampled. We're immediately beneath the River Weir, about 150 metres beneath the River Weir, where this water was raining down. Um, within the wind sill underground at that point, well above the granite, all the same. But there was evidence then from that water that we had got this, um, uh, the, this geothermal resource. I think the, there's a few bits gone astray on the, uh, the labelling of this diagram, but never mind. But we did the water chemistry in 1988. We reported 70 milligrams per litre of lithium in this brine in the mine that long ago. And what was interesting with that was that if you look at a, a sodium-lithium plot against a sodium-potassium plot, you can differentiate out the ones with high lithium at the bottom of this graph and the, uh, the, the North Pennine water at the Weirdale mine lies within those high lithium waters uh, that are found in Cornwall. So we knew at that stage, that from published data, that we got a similar water to the water from South Crofty, from the other prospective deposits in Cornwall. Whereas uh, there's another trend which is heading up to lower lithium, higher numbers on that sodium to lithium axis, which is more towards uh, the sedimentary basin type. So, so that, that was a good hint at that time about this lithium prospect, although we didn't know about it at that time. We weren't interested in lithium at that time, other than as a geochemical indicator. But it did give us evidence for this fluid circulation, and by doing some chemical modelling of the uh, water compositions, we could show that that water had achieved its chemical composition at about 160 to 170 degrees C. So that was evidence of a heat source down there, which we were able to exploit. So this then took us to the Eastgate Geothermal Exploration Project in 2003 to 2014. These things take a long time uh, because of the way in which funding is released. Uh, this was a project that depended on the redevelopment of the cement works, and it was funded by One North East. So we're extremely grateful to One North East as a development agency for enabling this to happen. Uh, there was an ambitious plan at the time to regenerate the site as a, a model renewable energy village. And this was where we were going to take hot water from this vein to turn it into uh, a, take it to a spa where people could bathe in hot water. There would be uh, renewable energy for people there, bearing in mind that all of the heating energy sources at that part of uh, Weirdale are brought in by road, okay? There's no piped energy of any kind. There's obviously electricity coming in, but most people at that time were relying on bottled gas and coal. So this was going to be a game changer. One North East led the project, and there was a grant of 460,000 to get it off the ground. So you know, this was an occasion where we found a grant that enabled this to happen. One of the key elements of uh, this to help de-risk it, if you like, was the fact that we'd encountered that hot water. I had bathed in hot water in Camper Keel's mine, and so we knew there was water there. But what we had to do was locate the mineral vein, the slit vein, that was our target, because we knew that was where the water was flowing. So you can see in this overhead photo where, where the red cross shows where um, the slit vein 
is the, uh, the again, that's migrated a little bit, unfortunately, with the uh, uh, slide variety. You can see Kamakil's mine there. Oh, yeah, the cross is okay. The cross is where the, uh, the site is that we were planning to drill, but we had to find it. And so, um, if you're looking for something vertical, and you, it's no wider than this room, and you've got a drilling rig that you've got to put on, you've got to put a stake in the ground and tell the driller where to drill. And we, we did that through um, locating the vein by drilling obliquely, as I'll show you shortly. But the uh, plan was, let's see, to drill down through the overlying strata, to intercept the vein. The assumption was that the vein would have small veins coming off it, with fractures associated with it, and we'd go into the Weirdell granite at depth to intercept water that was flowing on the vein much deeper and so much hotter. So the drilling was done in the bottom left-hand picture there. You can see with the, uh, the drill being inclined, uh, a bit of triangulation, graph paper, geometry to show where to put it. And we were able to identify the center to put the, uh, the drilling rig, which was uh, Farako, who won the tender for that particular job. So it was centered on that mineral vein. It drilled down into the windsill at 17 and a half inches and 12 and a half inches into the granite. We cased it to 403 meters so that all the water inflowing from higher up in the well was uh, sealed off and then drilled down in the granite for, uh, until we reached 995 meters. And we left them off the last five meters because the drill bit looked like the picture at the bottom there. Uh, the drill bit was completely um, wrecked and um, it, would have, it wasn't worth their while putting another one on just to get five more meters. What was really interesting about this was that we intercepted a fissure at 411 meters depth and there was a pressure kick. They thought there was going to be a blowout. You don't get blowouts when you're drilling in granite, but there was a pressure kick and the, this was quite remarkable. It was yielding 50 to 60 cubic meters per hour of water, which is quite remarkable in granite. So after a period of time, we did some pump tests. We put a packer, which is in the bottom right photograph there, uh, into the well that blew up against the side to isolate the overlying water sources of water so we could pump from that, uh, that fracture. And we would then be able to figure out what the, uh, the water yield was and uh, then to work out what the, um, what the thermal response was of this particular well. And it was good. I mean, we were producing, um, we had a bottom hole temperature of 46, where we'd expected 35 degrees C. Uh, we worked out what the heat production was, uh, uh, which was useful, and then to put it into terms which people can understand. A, four, uh, a cubic kilometer of that Weirdell granite is what it takes to produce four kilowatts of energy. So a four kilowatt fire in your room is drawing upon a cubic kilometer of Weirdell granite. It just illustrates the scale of the water circulation that has to take place. We did pumping trials in July 2010. Let's just see if we can get this to work. Um, I don't know whether that will go. Yeah. That was during the pump test. It's just oozing water. So that was, and it was hot enough to bath a baby at 60 cubic meters an hour. And you, know, you had to stop people from wanting to jump into it because it's beautiful, crystal clear water. So just move on from there. We've published all of this, and uh, nothing that's in this uh, presentation has not appeared in, in publications, uh, which uh, has um, enabled developments of the type we, we've been listening to earlier today. The water chemistry has been particularly interesting, and I'm comparing here the data we got from the, those pump tests that we just listened to with what we got back in 1988, samples in 1988. So we're getting, or we got at that time, 92 milligrams per litre of lithium, but in a brine of 27,700 milligrams per litre chloride. Again, the, 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 those more recent uh, chemical compositions told us it was about 150 to 190 degrees C. Uh, very similar to what we found before from the mine itself. What we'd be really interested in seeing is what the water chemistry is like now with samples that might be taken now uh, after a period of rest. So what happened next? Well, from our point of view for geothermal, um, obviously one northeast life came to an end in the bonfire of the Quangos. Um, the Eastgate project ended and we moved on to Newcastle Science Central where we had this uh, uh, two kilometre deep well that we put down to see if we could repeat the success of Eastgate in Newcastle. But for those of you who know the city, we didn't. It was a dry hole. Uh, now we're using it as a research hole. Uh, we've got um, one and a half million out of the research councils to figure out how to get heat out of a dry hole. And that's something which helps de-risk these, uh, these large investments. And then so lithium's come along. And the world's changed once more. 
And that's what's really exciting. You know, what goes around comes around. And uh, th that background knowledge that we were able to generate is something I'm extremely proud of. And I know Paul would be extremely proud of it as well to help support the, the industry which we're listening to today. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, has anyone got any questions for, for, for David? Peter? Stick your hand up if you want to ask for this. Okay, we've got another one after you. So. No, David, um, we're, um, as you know, Peter from Weird Lithium, and I'm now playing with your hole. And I just actually <laughs> asked one question that on an earlier slide, you showed the fissure at 400 meters, yeah. which presumably was the primary inflow of water, but you extended the casing a bit lower than that, why did you do that? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the, the casing is actually above the fissure, but we put a packer in below it, and that was to, to isolate it, uh, because we wanted to know what the granite itself would yield. But, so, but did that allow the water from the fissure to flow down into the hole? Only if it went through the granite, and we believe it didn't do that. But you, you, what the problem is, uh, was that um, these fissures were horizontal, and we did a downhole video Yep. which uh, shows that as you go down the ground, it's a bit like up sailing down a cliff in Cornwall. You're seeing these horizontal fissures due to the weathering and the, uh, the jointing of the granite coming out. And so the, the model, if you like, was like a, a weathered basement aquifer in, in Africa or something like that, where you've got this fissuring. And what you don't know is how those fissures connect in the three dimensions, because they're, they're following a random set of cracks, if you like, that uh, relate to unloading, unroofing, and weathering, which goes back to Devonian times in this particular case. So they're very ancient. So the, the, the water chemistry would suggest that it came from deeper because it's more saline, but we would need to revisit that. And that's something that could be done in that hole now because that fissure system will still be there. The casing will be as it was left. The packer will have been taken out. Uh, so in theory, that could be interrogated again. Thank you. And I think we're moving into areas which will be boring for everyone else and I'll speak to you separately about thanks. <laughs> Uh, David, David um, really dumb question, but you talk about flow rates. Um, is this water under pressure at that depth, or is it flowing from A to B, or is this something you've got to look at further? So the way we did it was by pumping it out and using an airlift pump to, to do that. In fact, and actually we used a rotary pump for it. Uh, it didn't need airlift. Uh, the interesting thing about it was that the water level rose during those pump tests which is not what the hydrogeologist expected, i.e. Paul. And the way we accounted for that was that we were drawing in hotter water, and so there was thermal expansion in the well, and because it's such a long column of water, that expansion was measurable. I should say it never became artesian, which was a matter of some relief, although the sheep would have liked it. <laughs> Can you, can you clarify for us, I mean, did you say 92 milligrams a litre for lithium? How does this compare to anywhere else in the world? It's um, on a par with the Cornish. It's slightly less, but it's on a par with what there is in the Cornish granite. Uh, but it's nothing like what you get in the Salars of South America. Just on the topic of the slip vein, I would usually expect a vein to have a lower permeability than surrounding strata, so the fact that we're using that as our fractured source mm. is a little bit confusing. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And this is where um, the, the geologist could go off at a tangent, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Peter's uh, sort of telling me not to do that. Um, it's really interesting the way in which a vein of that type is fractured, and obviously you see that when you're mining a vein like that because there's a natural fracture system in the vein. And those fluorite veins are, vein, are, are cross-cut by fracture fills of quartz. And the interesting thing is that the, the silica geothermometer suggests that they formed at 40 degrees C. So it suggests that there were fractures there very recently. It suggests that those fractures were filled very recently, maybe within the last couple of million years. So, you know, there's, there's, there's evidence there. I mean, no one can prove it one way or the other until they come along with a better experiment than the one we did. Um, and I stand to be corrected, I hasten to say. But uh, it's always intrigued me that we've got this multiple regeneration of fractures within a, 
a, a vein of that type, um, generations of cement. And the whole idea of going doing that original sampling in the 88s was to see, in 88, was to see whether or not the circulation systems of the water in the springs of Weirdale could be a, a vestige, if you like, of the mineralizing system. Sure, yeah. Seb Leeper from Water Cycle Technologies. Um, our company is, is looking at DLE, and um, one option for DLE is to return the delithiated water back into the aquifer. Um, what are your thoughts on, on that process, and do you envisage there being challenges with this particular geology? There are always challenges trying to pump water back down again, and um, yet yeah, that's the best place for it uh, because of the high salinity. And, uh, we, you, know, you wouldn't want to have to dispose of the volumes of water of that salinity in Weirdale anyway um, because of the, um, the sensitivity of the river and the, the need to take it out. So uh, from that point of view, I would want to see it re-injected. And that's something which you know, we, we'll have to see how that develops because I believe that's part of the plan, isn't it, uh, at the moment, Stuart, to look at the possible circulation. The Environment Agency are very clear that the um, water needs to be re-injected back into the, to the granite. And David is absolutely right, it is the best place for it. It does present some quite interesting technological challenges for us, um, but that's something that we look forward to embracing. Um, but it will go back in, um, unless you can make it drinkable for us. <laughs> The really interesting thing, and David has, she hasn't talked about the second borehole. We have a second borehole here. And that gives us the opportunity to test re-injection through that second borehole. And that is a game changer because nobody else in the UK currently has a second borehole. Cornish are drilling a second at the moment. So we are ahead of the game. Sarah Broadbent from um, Arab Geotechnics. Uh, secondary question, do you end up with a precipitate issue if you've brought these materials up from depth, they're going through a pressure change, temperature change, they're cooling down a bit on the way. Do we then end up with a scaling problem at the surface? Uh, I've, I've still got bottles of this stuff in my office that are as clear as the day it came out. So Would you drink it? <laughs> a, bit, a bit salty, a bit like drinking iron brew. <laughs> I was going to go a bit, a bit off piece and ask about about uh, Helix as you're here because I'm a, a big fan of the project, and obviously I didn't I didn't bring up the fact that we have been mining coal here in the city for some yes. time, right? So the development at Helix is a coal mine, and, and it wasn't possible to build the rest of the development without extracting the coal. So I alluded to the fact we haven't stopped mining in the northeast, and we we have we have been doing it, admittedly in a city centre location, which is not where you normally would do it. Um, in terms of the dry borehole issue and the geothermals, while you were here. What, what's the prospects of that from a research perspective? Because I'm, I'm yeah. quite intrigued by it as a... I was, I was involved in the council when we were talking about this the first time, so I have a long history with the issue. So I was, I was intrigued to, to hear what, what, what's moved on since I've stopped being so close to it. Yes, so the, uh, what happened was the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council uh, has launched a programme called Decarbonising Heating and Cooling, and I'm pleased to say that Durham University and Newcastle University have done very well out of those um, two rounds that have been funded so far. And um, in the first round, we won the funding um, to work with Glasgow University, who are doing the modelling, to look at how you, a well of that type could couple with a building like the Urban Science Building, which is instrumented to within an inch of its life, so we know exactly what its energy demand is throughout the annual cycle. And that then allows us to go back to that well and say, are there new developments in the way in which heat can be extracted from a well which would meet the demand of that building? So the situation at the present time is that the modelers have done all their work. We've just uh, been going through a tender exercise to get contractors in to do thermal response tests on the well. Um, we're awaiting the outcome of those uh, um, 
that tendering process at the moment. Uh, so we'll get some equipment on site, all being well in, within the next eight or nine months to give us the data that the modelers need to tell us whether or not, uh, or tell them whether or not their models are, are working well. It ties into the UK Geoenergy Observatories project, which um, George Osborne uh, funded at 31 million, uh, where there's a, uh, what we're able to do in terms of it being public domain matches onto the capability in Glasgow, which is coal mine geothermal, and that site now exists and is up and running. And in Cheshire, it's being built in aquifer geothermal, as I mentioned this morning. So we've, in the public sector, we've got three experimental setups which can investigate three different types of geothermal. Uh, we're looking forward to doing more with the Helix well because there's going to be another call on decarbonising heating and cooling. What we'd really like to see is more innovate funding coming in this direction because there's a limit to what you can get from the Research Council funding at very low TRL uh, because that's uh, so competitive, uh, quite rightly. Um, but we're at a point where we can do experiments on these facilities with industry funding through Innovate and through schemes of that type, which would be the next step.